everybody, Joe here, Psychedelics Today. Thanks for tuning in again. Today, Kyle and I didn't really have time to get a new recording out for you, so we dug through our archives and found a quick, short lecture from Lenny Gibson, one of our mutual breathwork teachers, and it's from a MAPS dinner maybe a year or two ago where they talked about the history, or Lenny presented on the history of psychedelics in the Western world and gave a pretty good rundown. I think this is really critical information and people really should know more about this subject than they do currently. So that's why we're broadcasting it. I gave it a listen this morning and really did enjoy it. So I think you'll like it too. Let us know what you think. You can reach us over at you know Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, <laughs> Psychedelics Today. Just search that. You'll find it. Or email at Psychedelics Today. Email at gmail.com. And... We wanted to remind you all that we do have a really cool class that we're offering online called Navigating Psychedelics, where we give essentially a 101 slash 102 education on psychedelics to students. And we also have, I think, maybe even 14, don't quote me on that, 14 master classes by experts on their individual expertise area. We tried to give a broad spectrum so everything from microdosing to picking a safe, good ayahuasca center, prepping for ceremonial psychedelic sessions. Mitch Gomez joins us from Dance Safe. He's the executive director over there. He gives us a lot of safety tips and some really interesting info. So we really think you'll like it and totally check it out. You can find that from our main website, psychedelicstoday.com, or find it at psychedelicstoday.teachable.com. And secondly, we really think you should check out our friend Eric Osborne's Myco Meditations. He is doing legal psilocybin mushroom retreats. He's calling them psilocybin-assisted retreats in Jamaica at a beach called, I think it's Treasure Beach. And it's, I think, on the western side of the island. And he's been developing this organization for probably 15 years, and people really enjoy his work down there. So definitely something to check out. Coming up in November, though, is a special retreat with Catherine McLean and Shane Moss. Catherine was involved in some of the research with psilocybin at John Hopkins. She's also a presenter on our master class helping out with integration subjects. And she's definitely a real expert, highly regarded in the field. She's got some great TED Talks out there. So, you know, if you want to check her out, yeah, Google Catherine McLean TED Talk. And Shane Moss, who is actually a really famous comedian at this point, kind of blowing up because he's really identified with the psychedelic space. And he actually, I believe, headlined with Duncan Trussell at the recent Oakland Psychedelic Science Conference. I guess that was in April. <laughs> so, yeah, really fun. Yeah, both of those two will be there. It should add a very interesting dimension to the retreat. So you could actually like ask them specific questions that Eric might not have expertise on or talk to them about integration or what, you know, <laughs> Shane, what was your DMT experience like? Or Eric is definitely an expert on mushrooms. Don't know how much he's dug into ayahuasca. So it would be cool to have people that have more broader experiences talking about other drugs. But yeah, in terms of mushroom experts, I don't know that there's anybody facilitating groups like this out in the open who have this much experience. I think Eric is the only person out there offering these kind of retreats and why not take advantage of it? He is <laughs> over at Myco Meditations. So Google that. He's got a great podcast so you can get a sense of him. We also had him on the show. I think it was our third most popular show because we got into some really awesome subjects. So check that out. Let us know what you think and let him know uh, you found out about him from us because he'll help us out. So that's it for now. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this talk with Lenny Gibson, our breathwork teacher out of Vermont. And let us know what you think. Psychedelics Today, email at gmail.com. Let us know on Facebook or wherever. Take care. Bye-bye. When I met Albert Hoffman, I introduced myself to him by telling him my birthday, which was April 17th, 1943. And he burst out laughing. <laughs> and I can tell your age by whether you laughed or not. <laughs> <laughs> there are three, I think, modern turning points in 
the modern history of psychedelics. I'll go back to the ancient in just a minute. But the first one being when Albert had his experience that led him to realize the psychotropic properties of his the substance he had synthesized. The second one was Gordon Wasson and his wife Valentina when they connected with Maria Sabina, who was a Corandaro who used the, the, the mushrooms. And that resulted in the introduction of psilocybin in addition to LSD. And the third one was when Hoffman and Wasson worked together, and Hoffman was able to synthesize psilocybin on the base of the mushrooms. And then it became a readily available, instead of having to go to some obscure place in Mexico and beg people and find somebody who practiced, it was a mass-produced chemical. But the use of substances in providing transcendent moments goes back beyond the beginnings of our written history in the West. And there were many shamanic traditions. The shamanic tradition in Greece led to the development of the tragic plays, the great tragic plays of Sophocles and Aeschylus. The Greek word tragedy literally means goatskin because in the festivals of Dionysius, who was the god of wine, when the new wine was decanted and everybody got really high on the new wine, it gave people permission to act like goats. And as you know, the Dionysius was portrayed as half man, half goat. Dionysius had also been to the underworld and back. Like Orpheus, another person that comes out of the shamanic traditions and into what we call the Greek mystery religions. The most prominent of the mystery religions was one called the Eleusinian Mysteries. A mystery not in the sense of Ellery Queen, but a mystery in the sense of <coughs> mystical. That rite goes back beyond recorded time and lasted for at least 2,000 years. It was a rite built around the myth of, Dem myth of Demeter and Persephone. There's Maria Sabina. We can come. I should pause, Maria. And there's Gordon, Gordon Wasson's book. Persephone, the site of the temple of Eleusis. Persephone was out picking flowers in the meadow on a spring day, and Hades came along and grabbed her took her down into the underworld. Demeter, her mother, was distraught, but Persephone was gone. Demeter appealed to the other gods for help getting Persephone back. It was of no use. So finally, Demeter, since she was the goddess of agriculture and growing things, decided that she would stop everything growing. Clearly a symptom of depression. <laughs> I did that for the psychiatrists in the audience. <laughs> Didn't bother the gods because they lived on ambrosia. But then it occurred to them that if the human being starved to death, there'd be no one to worship the gods. That got to them, and they agreed to help Demeter and prevailed upon, upon Hades to let Persephone come back. But she had sampled a few maybe one or seven seeds from, from pomegranate. And the way those myths work, she couldn't be completely freed of Hades and had to ended up spending half her time in Hades and half with her mother. Thus, the variation of the season. So the myth is about going into the underworld, coming back, basically about death and rebirth. And appears to have involved an ergot-derived substance a psychedelic. The first, we don't know exactly because the initiates were sworn to secrecy and the secret was never revealed. 2,000 years. All of the major people, all the intelligentsia and many of the regular people of Greece were initiates into it. You could do it once. And Pindar, the famous poet who was also initiated along with Plato and Xenophon and the, the whole, even to the Romans, Cicero was an initiate. Marcus Aurelius was the last Roman emperor who was an initiate. Othon was killed when Constantine converted the Roman Empire to Christianity. Pindar says, not revealing the secret, but says of the rite, it was 
an experience of dying before dying. But as I said, Constantine saw the ring of fire and decided that the Roman Empire should become Christian. They should stop persecuting the Christians and become part of it. And so Christianity doesn't have a very good track record with substances other than wine and Eucharist. But you're a psychedelic for a very limited group of people who are intensely into the sacred technology of the Mass. So the Middle Ages is a kind of, in the West, is a kind of desert as far as psychedelics are concerned. And we don't really find anything of interest until we jump up to the 19th century. Havelock Ellis took peyote on Good Friday, 1897. He wrote it up for the British Journal of Medicine. They rejected it. Too fantastical. His other major work, which was in the psychology of sex, seven volumes, sold very well. He gave some peyote buttons to William Butler Yeats, who realized that we're all slouching towards Bethlehem. So some of the people that are denizens of the psychedelic history in modern times, Humphrey Osmond worked at a little mental hospital up in Saskatchewan and began experimenting with psilocybin, peyote, I forget. Psilocybin, I think it was. Doesn't make a whole lot of difference. That's like North Korea, South Korea, North Vietnam, South Vietnam. You get them mixed up all the time, as Richard Nixon <laughs> testified. <laughs> but Aldous Huxley somehow learned of his work and sent him a note and said, "Hey, when you're in L if you're in L.A., come by and see me." Osmond didn't think it would ever happen, but in fact, it was a bureaucratic problem at the hospital and they needed to reorganize and put get rid of the move Osmond up and get rid of the guy that was above him. And so they while they were doing that they sent Osmond off to an APA convention in LA and he got in touch with Huxley. They went to a few sessions of the APA convention and were bored to tears. So they adjourned back to Huxley's place in Osmond turned him on. It took about 90 minutes before it really hit him, and then it blew his mind. Huxley, you're at Brave New World, Ape in Essence. Okay. Huxley was like the major intellectual of the, one of the major intellectuals of the mid and an enormously successful author, half blind, but an intensely intellectual, part of a circle of people that stretches back really to Havelock Ellis and two more recent people. Hesse, Herman Hesse, Siddhartha, the glass bead game, Magister Rudy, Carl Jung, these are all people who tried mescaline. But the psychedelic experience was restricted to a very small elite. And Huxley, upon trying the, the, the called it, the most extraordinary and significant experience available to human beings this side of the beatific vision. The doors of perception he produced as a result of it. In there, he mentions C.D. Broad, a British philosopher who characterizes the brain as a cerebral reducing valve. And Huxley's, one of the first theories here was that psychedelics eliminate some of the filtering of the brain. Fairly crude, so we have a lot more sophisticated stuff. Now, Robin Carhart Harris has advanced that considerably. Huxley was also friends with a fellow named Gerald Hurd, who was, again, a major intellectual personage in the early mid 20th century. The two of them eventually came into contact with a guy named Al Hubbard, nicknamed Cappy, because he was the president of the Vancouver Yacht Club and also of the Uranium Corporation in Vancouver, out of Vancouver. He is best described as a kind of peripatetic imp. And he 
Wrote off the Sandoz, got a huge supply of LSD, and just trotted around the world turning people on. But kept it limited to a very small group of people like this. There's Gerald Hurd, there's Oscar Janiger, who eventually, who was a psychiatrist in Beverly Hills, who found out about LSD, got a large supply of it, and in a group around him, Huxley, Hurd, Hubbard, Janiger, Sidney Cohen, they were involved in Salon in the LA area, and their recording secretary was Anna and I. Pardon? Anna and I is the way it's pronounced in the song. <laughs> Tell me what kind of man this Jesus is, Anna and I. <laughs> Janiger also obtained DMT and introduced that into the whole thing. Another fellow that we'll get to, there's Sidney Cohen, and he's trying LSD on housewives. <laughs> Give him a minute. We'll just hang on, hang on to your seats for a little while. Okay, so Alan Watts got into this, but before I leave the, the earlier group behind, Humphrey Allison first proposed the term psychedelic at a meeting of the New York Academy of Sciences in 1957. <clears throat> He said the word meant mind manifesting from the two Greek words mm. for psyche, psyche, and delos, which means clear. Huxley had sent Osmond a rhyme in which he suggested, which went, to make this trivial world sublime, take a half a gram of phanero time. <laughs> Tumas means spiritedness in Greek. Osmond wrote back, to fathom of a Heaven, to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have to remember Maria, Sabina, and Wasson from the, that early slide introduced psilocybin, and that was what Tim Leary started with. Now, until Tim Leary came along, the psychedelic usage, uh, although it was a growing circle, was pretty much limited to a fairly elite circle, a circle mm -hmm. of intellectuals. And a few housewives, as you saw. <laughs> but then Timothy Leary got a hold of psilocybin. And this is a major turning point because Tim Leary couldn't contain himself. And in some ways, he advanced things enormously, and in other ways, he set them back terribly. Okay. But certainly, and there you see him in some of his many guises. The, the basic issue was he was started out doing reasonable research at Harvard and he couldn't keep it in and started spewing it out. And so you get the stuff starting to come out into very, into settings that are not conducive to people getting the best out of it. And he became involved with these folks. Okay. Good old Alan. William Burroughs, you may, some of you may know, he was heir to the Burroughs fortune, the Burroughs adding machine. Didn't have to work a day in his life. And finally ended up preferring heroin. Which he said the only problem was it caused constipation. Which is probably just about right. The reason for its deleterious effects is because of the culture that we use it in. But basically, as long as you deal with constipation and have plenty of money, you're fine. You don't have to steal things. It's the stealing that really makes it problematic. <laughs> well said. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, it's a cultural problem. In Portugal, in the Netherlands, it's not a problem because they provide it. People don't have to reuse needles. They don't have to steal to support their habit. So the problem if you want to stop? If you want to stop, you just stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you don't want to stop, you don't stop. 
Maybe when the constipation gets to you, you know, that's enough. I mean, in the ways of jiggering with it, it's just another phase of prohibition, okay? And the problem is, it's a cultural problem. Yeah. If you're working in a safe environment, you're not going to overdose. If you're in a clinic where it's supervised, and most people get tired of it after a while. Okay, but, so here we have these guys, Kerouac on the road, and Ellen Watts, who was a great talker. So, East Coast, we got Tim Leary. Mm -hmm. West Coast, we got Ken Kesey, Neil Cassidy, coming out of On the Road. There's the bus. The first acid tests, which morphed into the trips festivals, which morphed into Burning Man. Burning Man. I said that. Ah. The first human being. And down there in the corner is one of the sponsors, Augustus Stanley Owsley III, who learned how to make, who had a girlfriend who was good at making LSD and he produced zillions of doses, really cheap, blew it out of, and it's out, it's out of all. But we got some problems here. The war, psychedelics and the anti-war movement started synergizing each other and the government got really scared. They had been interested in LSD early on. There was a guy named James Moore who accompanied Wasson, Gordon, and Valentina to Mexico under the pretext of being a photographer at one of those CIA plants. Okay? And he brought psilocybin back to the mushrooms, back to the CIA. They were interested in it because of it having mind effects. They discovered was when they gave it to the spies, those hardened spooks ended up over in the corner weeping and crying about brotherly love. Other than the ones who ran frantically out of the room and had to be chased down in Virginia where they were found under a fountain talking about those terrible eyes and the monsters that were assaulting them. So it didn't work out for the CIA. Prohibition. California criminalized LSD on October 7, 1966. And that's when things started to head down, okay? Because it drove it underground. And the worst thing you can do, I mean, prohibition, it's like, will we ever learn, okay? We tried prohibition with alcohol. When I lived in Oklahoma, one of the lines there was, it was still dry, there was still dry county in Oklahoma in the 1970s. And the line was, they would remain dry as long as the Baptists and the bootleggers could stagger to the poles. Went underground and at the same time proliferated. Sasha Shulgin, wonderful man, wonderful, wonderful man. He could give a lecture on chemistry that was just, if you didn't know a bit about chemistry, you would be fascinated. Okay? And there he is with his wife, Anne, and immortalized by Alex Gray. And there's one of his dirty pictures down there in the corner. He called them dirty pictures, the molecules. There's a great video on YouTube, uh, Sasha's, of Alexander, dirty pictures, a wonderful video. And here's other folks of later time. Now, Richard Alpert, of course, was with Tim Leary at Harvard early on, but they diverged. India took on Alpert, but it didn't take on Tim. And we see Tim in an early phase down there in the corner. We see him in his post-India phase when he turned back into just an ordinary transcendental. We have the intellectualization of Ken Wilber, mm -hmm. and we have a leprechaun fully, fully as filled with the impishness as was Happy, Terry McKenna. That book, I remember, going to the Unitarian Church in L.A. after Ram Dass had come back from India. And it was lovely, and it was robes and beads and flowers, and it was just fun. And they were passing out this thing, said, if you want a copy of this book we're going to publish, you know, got one of these cards, they're going, oh, these hippies, it'll never, I'm not going to buy it, I got the card, because it'll never happen. But it did. And it's still in publication. Then, as the glorious 
phase was being dampened by the criminalization and all. It came from Czechoslovakia, this fellow Stanislav Grof, where Stanislav Grof had been, when he was graduating from gymnasium, gymnasium like high school, junior college, in the summer after gymnasium, he wanted to become a cartoonist. He liked to draw cartoons. He was headed for the state animation school. He had put in his application, because you go right from gymnasium to university or professional school or whatever, and a friend of his came by who had found a copy of Freud's Interpretation of Dreams. Freud was forbidden literature in communist culture, Czechoslovakia, behind the Iron Curtain at that point. And the friend was very excited about the book, you know, trying to get a college kid today to read the Interpretation of Dreams. It's impossible. But tell him they can't. Okay. And boy. <laughs> Stan picked up excitement and begged to borrow the book. He said he stayed up all night reading it. Withdrew his application to film school and put in one to become to medical school. He wanted to become a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst, which he did, trained underground, doing his residence at Charles Hospital in Prague, where they were working with the Sandoz Corporation in the development of some of the new major tranquilizers, Melrose, they were working with. And Stan says, you know, when you work with a pharmaceutical company, they're always sending you stuff. And they said, in the program he was in, there appeared a box of ampules of LSD from Sandoz Laboratories. And they started a research program that was totally the opposite of what Tim Leary's operation was. Communist country, people play things close to their chest. Amazing research. Curing, curing, not suppressive like most of the psychotropics, the tranquilizers were. Like curative of people with profound depression. In his book, it's now called LSD, Door to the Numinous. It was called Homes of the Human Unconscious originally. But a fellow who was severely catatonically depressed for a long time, their practice was to give a small dose of LSD, didn't get anything, they increased the dose, kept increasing. They'd gotten this guy up to 3,500 micrograms, okay? 3,500 micrograms before they got the first reaction. The guy got up out of his room, went to the kitchen, made a bologna sandwich, and then went to the day room and played chess. Sounds like my day. <laughs> 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 so, Stan got out of Czechoslovakia to this country, said he came out there, only allowed two suitcases. He had his notes and two shirts. Came and fortuitously hooked up with a man named Walter Pankey, who had Timothy Leary in his still relatively stable phase as a dissertation advisor and engaged the famous Good Friday experiment. Mm -hmm. Walter Pankey was a physician who'd taken a sabbatical to go to divinity school, then went back to Johns Hopkins and was working with cancer patients on whom the oncologists had given up because they were beyond any help. They were in pain, they were in despair, they were scared. And they were using LSD with these patients. All the videotapes had gone. The last little bits of videotape burned when Stan's house burned down some years ago. Most astounding videotape is a guy who was a stevedore on the docks of Baltimore in his 60s, metastasized melanoma. They couldn't give him anything orally. They had to inject him with dipropyltryptamine. Stan is sitting for him. And in the course of this session, this man goes from a sort of Neanderthal with like maybe a vocabulary of 600 words, half of which are profanities, just most, but mostly grunts. Rah, 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 rah. His family had abandoned him. And in the course of this session, he is transformed and he's lecturing the great Dr. Stanislav Graf about the great recycling yard in the sky. I cried because I, I've been through throat cancer myself. I'm with people who are cancer survivors and who are still facing terror. And with 35, 40 years, he could have been making it better. 
But we're getting there, finally. I never thought it would happen. <clears throat> so here's Stan with Christina when they were young and in love. They always were in love. There's Stan with Albert. Albert. Albert Hoffman. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he and Stan were good buddies. And there he is with Hans Rudy Dieger. Dieger. The Decess of the Alien. And Stan's latest book focuses on Dieger's art. And there's Alex Gray. There's Stan with Mr. Shamanism, another leprechaun. I'm sorry, who's that with the shamanism you said? And that's the bottom right? The Way of the Shaman. Michael Shaman. Yeah. Michael Harner, who was the one who brought shamanism into the mix in the mid-50s. Went to the Amazon as a field anthropologist, ended up going native, apprentice with a shaman. They were learning the spirit of the river and the spirit of the trees and the spirit of the tiger. And then one day the shaman says, now we're going to the spirit of the outboard motor. <laughs> Blew his mind. That's what I like. <laughs> outboard motor. <laughs> so Michael has wonderful stories. Wonderful stories. He's pretty old right now, but I think he can still tell stories. Wonderful stories about how when the missionaries come in, missionaries come in, Everybody, they, they, these guys have heard every, their own stories over and over again. You know, they're kind of, the missionaries come in with these new stories. So one night a missionary's in and they're walking back down to the river because the only way to get around the Amazon is with boats. Walking back down to the river the next morning with the missionary and they're chatting and joking. And so he's saying, you know, we really love that Lazarus story. Well, some of you may have had biblical training. Oh yeah? Yeah, we tried it and it works. At which point the missionary moved a little faster toward the river. So, Stan came up with this thing. He couldn't use the Johns Hopkins thing fell apart when LSD became criminalized. Michael Murphy and he fortuitously hooked up and he invited Stan to Esalen as scholar in residence. After a few years, Stan needed to produce some income for Esalen, so he put together this technique called holotropic breathwork, which when I was telling Stan about for the second time, he didn't, he wasn't quite focused on that the reason I decided upon holotropic breathwork training to, to go to in this holotropic breathwork training was because I had an experience in holotropic breathwork that was identical with the most powerful experience I've ever had with, with LSD. And Stan said, that's what convinced me too. It's not like taking a pill and you don't have any choice, but because you got to work at it. That's why it's called breath work. Mm -hmm. But you can get to the same place. Mm -hmm. And Rick Doblin was in. There were two parallel groups of trainees in holotropic breath work in the mid eighties. Rick mm -hmm. Doblin was in one of them, mm -hmm. and Rick got it that. Timothy Leary wasn't the way to go. The way to go was to start, get the credentials, go slowly and slowly and slowly, and it's effective, okay? And through the holotropic breathwork training, it's brought people together who had that interest that was disappointed as the 60s began to fade. A fellow named Michael Minhofer, who became the lead word searcher for MDMA. So the holotropic breathwork stuff really has been the means, has been the leverage that's kept things going and as far as it, where we're actually have hope now that we're going to get this. Now, the 60s, one of the artifacts of the 60s there, and that's the internet. So psychedelics for psychological healing, and I was they understand, you know, isn't it great, you know, all this, it, it's finally, you know, the, the, the stuff's been done, Michael's doing the MDMA stuff, and Stan says, yeah, but he says, you know, that's all been done, it's all been written up before, it's all there, just been forgotten. He says, the real potential is creativity. Mm. And indeed, from counterculture to cyberculture, He's, uh, Rick has been working in the psychological realm, and some of the other people that came out of the 60s, Steve Jobs among them. Mm -hmm. The future looks bright to me, and I'm sure happy I've lived long enough to see it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
So hope you all like that. Pretty short, pretty sweet. And I got a few giggles out of it. I really appreciate Lenny's sense of humor on his take on history. You know, being a person who lived through the 60s, he definitely has some direct experience to share about, you know, what the successes were, what maybe some of the shortcomings were. And his insights have very much been helpful to me. So I hope you liked that. And uh, you can check him out over at dreamshadow.com and there and lennygibson.com i believe he's got a lot of academic papers that he's been working on i think that's been his focus over the last few years just trying to synthesize alfred north whitehead with stan groff's work lsd meets whitehead like how do we make sense of the psychedelic experience through philosophy so been very meaningful to me to be able to work closely with him over the years and i hope you might be able to find some value there as well so again Check out our Navigating Psychedelics class, navigatingpsychedelics.teachable.com. Check out Myco Meditations, MYCO Meditations on Google. Let them know we sent you. We're about to launch a store, so keep a lookout for that. We'll have logo gear, stickers, stuff like that, cups. And hopefully, if you're inclined, you pick them up. And I think that's it for now. We'll talk to you again on the next episode. Bye-bye. 